Hi, this is Rain Moss Holder, and it's time for Dapples of the Circus by Clarence Hawks, published in 1926, rewritten in parts by Ray Moss Holder in 2022. Chapter 7 The Train Wreck. One of the ever present nightmares of the circus is railroad wrecks. An assistant manager for Barnum and Bailey Circus tells that he was in 13 wrecks in 12 years, and he thought himself lucky to escape with his life. This isn't strange, for the circus trains are forever on the move. But even this wouldn't account for so many wrecks were it not for the fact that the trains are always run as specials, being shoved in between others and often held up on sidings while the regular trains thunder by. So it's not strange that they too often come to grief. No company will insure a circus against either accidents or fire so the owners are their own insurance company. And in a very bad wreck or a fire, small circuses often go bankrupt. Freckles had heard a little about train wrecks up to the time of the wreck at Cedar Bend, but he didn't give it much attention. This one will go down in history as the worst wreck in the annals of circus people. These people rarely speak of their dangers, but bluff them away with smiling faces. Many of the trapeze artists and tumblers look death in the face every day, but they soon learn to cover up their fear and smile at danger. Freckles had always felt as safe on the train as he did off of it. He could sleep as well to the sound of rattling car wheels and clicking rails as he could to the night nice sounds in the country. So the great wreck at Cedar Bend, to his young mind, came out of nowhere. Might not have occurred at all if the American Railroad had been handling a very heavy consignment of the United States troops. It was during the first year that we were in the First World War and troop trains always had the right of way. Cedar Bend is a smoky, noisy manufacturing town in Indiana. It's also a railroad junction of no small order. So it's a place where trouble is liable to occur. The first section of the circus outfit had come into town. They'd been shunted upon a switch. The second section had been following it very closely, instead of half an hour behind, which is the usual way, so that the second section was standing on the main track. Investigation has never fully established how the crash happened, but a troop train crashed into the rear of it, and at the same time a local freight crashed in the front end. Then switchmen in the yards saw a sight they'd rarely seen before. The train buckled, and ten of the heavy cars reared into the air. It looked for all the world like a huge serpent that had reared its back. This, of course, broke all the couplings, so the cars came down in a sorry heap and went tumbling and crashing this way and that. Three of the cars almost immediately burst into flames. This was the section that contained many of the best ring and trick horses and also the largest animals, like the elephants and camels, was also the section in which rode our two friends, 
Freckles and Dapples. Freckles himself was in the second sleeper from the locomotive, and Sir Wilton was about midway in the train. The whistle on one of the wrecked locomotives turned on during the smash and set up a continuous shriek, while the other engine emitted a roaring scream of steam that made more noise than the whistle did. If a combination to produce blood-curdling sounds had been very carefully planned, it wouldn't have outdone the whistle, steam, and the terrified noise made by the medley of wild animals, many of them horribly mangled, and some of them imprisoned in the burning cars. There was a trumpeting and shrieking of elephants, the roaring of lions, the neighing of horses and camels, the braying and hee-hawing of zebras, and the chorus of cries from smaller animals that added to the horrible din. Soldiers swarmed from the troop train and hurried to assist the circus people. If so many capable men weren't at hand, the fatalities would have been far greater. As it was in almost no time, several hundred men were breaking windows and chopping holes in the sides of cars and releasing struggling horses and men. The animals, which seemed to be hopelessly maimed, were mercifully shot, and those that had been burned by the flames were also shot. All of the elephants but one, whose back had been broken, burst out of their cars and stampeded through the crowd. One of the lion cages was broken open, and two scared lions fled through the crowd as well. The first thing Freckles noticed out of the ordinary was the sudden lifting of his birth. It seemed to be rising straight up with him, and bits of glass were pelting his hands and his face. Then something struck his head, and he felt a strange, faint, sinking sensation, and everything went dark. Five minutes later, several Brahmi soldiers had broken their way into the half-telescope sleeper, where eight of the circus people were dead and lifted poor Freckles from his splintered berth and tenderly placed him in an ambulance. Two of his best friends were in the ambulance ahead of him, though he certainly didn't know it. Big Bill was severely injured, while Mr. Williams had luckily escaped with a dislocated soldier and a sprained ankle, plus several cuts from flying glass. As the ambulance moved away, Big Bill lifted himself up on his elbow and looked outside. Well, this beats anything I ever came across in the ten wrecks I've been through. Ringmaster Williams peeped through the window and saw a dappled Shetland pony following the ambulance, his nose close to the side of the car, as though he feared it would get away from him, and he was running on just three legs. Big Bill brushed the tears from his eyes and said, Lord, heal freckles and dapples too. Keep them both safe. Then Big Bill fell into a deep sleep. Mr. Bingham asked his ringmaster, Do you think that Sir Wilton knows Freckles is inside? Knows he's inside? Why, of course he does. Do you think he'd be chasing the ambulance like that on three legs if he didn't? I tell you, Mr. Bingham, I've seen some circus horses in my day. 
I've seen the best of them come and go, but I never in my life saw a horse that loved his driver as Dapples does that kid. You're right, Frank, returned Mr. Bingham. The first thing that Freckles remembered after the sensation that his birth in the sleeper was rising with him was that of being in a clean white bed in a long, quiet room. There were many other beds in the room, a long row of them, and on the pillow of each bed was a head, and all were the heads of kids his age or younger. Just what they were doing there, he couldn't imagine. His own thoughts were all in a jumble. His head ached terribly. There was a strange bag on it. it. Seemed to be full of something very cold. When he moved his head and pressed it against the contents of the bag, his head felt better. A pleasant young woman, whom he didn't think he had ever seen before, came to him now and then and did things for him. In fact, this young woman was constantly going up and down the room. There was a friendly man who wore a large pair of glasses. He came to see him twice a day. But who he was, poor Freckles couldn't even imagine. He tried and tried to think where he was or who these people might be, but still couldn't figure it out. When he asked the young woman, she explained it all to him. But even then, he couldn't remember what she said. When she mentioned something about a wreck and Bingham and Daly's circus, he thought he ought to understand, but he couldn't. So she finally told him not to bother his head about it, but that it would all come right very soon. The first thing he did remember was the name of his friend, Sir Wilton. He smiled up at the nurse and said, I remember him. He was a wonderful little horse. I used to ride him up in the pasture at Boystown. The nurse said, no, it was in the circus. Bingham and Daly's big show. Don't you remember? It was in a train wreck last week. The circus was wrecked. Freckles said incredulously, and showing interest for the very first time. Was that what made my birth rise up so quickly? Then a clutch of great fear seized the half delirious Freckles. Oh, lady. What became of Dapples, my little horse? The one I used to ride. Was he killed? Oh, no, replied the nurse quickly. He's all right. Circus men had him brought to a stable near the hospital. And when you're well, you can ride him again. But at that poor point, poor Freckles' mind went cloudy again. Dapples was killed in the wreck. There was a wreck, and he was killed in it. I'll never see him again. Tears ran down his cheeks. Vainly, the nurse tried to explain to him that Dapples was fine, that he would see him soon. But she couldn't get out of Freckles' head that Sir Wilton had been killed. Finally, the steward at the hospital, without telling anyone, tried a novel experiment. He'd read once about a man named Archie Roosevelt, the son of President Teddy Roosevelt, who had been sick, and his brother Kermit had conceived the idea that if he could see his favorite horse, it would cure him. So Kermit had coaxed the horse into a large elevator at the White House 
and had led the horse safely to his brother's room on the third floor. He reasoned that if that sort of thing could be done in the White House, it could be done in the hospital, especially in the children's ward on the first floor. About three o'clock that afternoon, the children in the ward saw the strangest sight ever seen in that hospital. And that was when the groom from the stable led Sir Wilton into the ward and down to the bed of his driver. At first, Freckles thought he was asleep and that he was dreaming. But when Dapple's nose touched his hand, he instantly knew who it was. The nurse would only let the pony stay a very few minutes, but this was enough to convince Freckles that his friend was alive and well, and this was the turning point in Freckles' sickness. It broke the delirium, and from that day on, he mended rapidly. In a week's time, he was placed in a wheelchair and wheeled out on the large piazza where the groom again brought Sir Wilton for a longer visit. One day, as Freckles was recovering, his nurse came in and said, You have another visitor. Several of the circus people had stopped by to visit with Freckles since he had his own mind back again. But this visitor was a real surprise. It was Mr. Williams, the ringmaster. Freckles said, Wow, I never expected to see you here. I'd stand up in honor of you if I had the strength to do it, sir. The ringmaster said, There's no reason to do that. We've been friends for a long time now. In fact, you should start calling me Frank, because it's my first name. Freckles said, Thank you, Frank. Then he stopped and said, <laughs> It seems strange to call you that. I have such great respect for you. Frank said, And that feeling is mutual. I have a great deal of respect for you. You know, I've watched you during good times and bad. I remember the night the elephants fought. You shimmied up a tree to watch as if you didn't have a care in the world. I've watched you too at other times when you could have gotten mad, even furious with people and except for your fight with Tony to protect Dapples, you seem to always have a smile on your face, and you forgive like nobody I've ever seen before. I don't know what your secret is, but I'm curious. Well, Mr. Williams, Frank. Well, Frank, if I tell you, you won't like it. Frank asked, what do you mean? I'd really like to know your secret. I. I don't blow my top often, but when I do, I really overdo. What stops you from doing that? God? Oh, no. It's your God again. He's the answer to your question. If there's anyone I love more than Dapples, it's God. Well, I came to visit you, and I have time to stay for a while. But you believe in God and I don't. So where do we go from here? Well, this isn't a trick question, Frank. But tell me, do you really believe this whole world was made by some primordial ooze coming out of the water? And presto, there was a world and people and animals and countries, and trees, and flowers, and everything else we know that's on the earth. 
No, I, I don't. Well, that's a good start. Let me make this simple as I can. Think of all the animals we have in the circus. Do you believe that an elephant came from a lion or a zebra or a monkey? Frank laughed, just thinking about how impossible that would be. He said, of course I don't. Now, could you ever believe that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth? Because it's obvious that believing the earth just happened or a primordial ooze somehow created it would be like believing every time our circus arrived in a new town, all the tents would go up by themselves. All the animals would simply know where they're supposed to be. All the performers would suddenly be costumed and there would be absolutely no need for anything to make it all go right, except maybe a primordial ooze. Everything would just happen. If you really think about it, everything that was made for our planet had to have an intelligent creator, and that's God. Frank thought about this and then said, but who created God? No one. God had always been, even before this world was created. That's why he's God. Okay, so now you're telling me that there was no creator who created God. That's a tough one to believe. Freckles responded, might be harder for you to believe that God wrote a book he wants you to read that explains it all. Now you're talking about the Bible. You know, I honestly, honestly tried to read the New Testament one night in a hotel, but I couldn't get past the big ants. So I read a novel I brought with me instead. Freckles smiled and said, you were starting with Matthew. Now Matthew wrote primarily to the Jews and he wanted them to realize that Jesus Christ had an awesome genealogy. You find some of the begats in the book of Luke too. You can skip them any time, but a true Jew who wanted to realize who their Messiah was really was. Probably wouldn't believe the Bible if the begats weren't right there at the beginning of the New Testament. Frank got a puzzled look on his face. He asked, can a Jew become a Christian? Freckles smiled again and said, sure, anybody can. But when a Jew becomes a Christian, they usually are called a messianic Jew because the Old Testament is just as real historically as the New Testament is. The ringmaster said, well, let me tell you why I don't believe in your God. After when I was born, my mother died when I was eight years old. I love my mom. She loved me. After she was gone, everything changed. My dad became a drunk. No matter what I did, he beat me. I mean, he wailed the living daylights out of me until I was 12. He just liked to beat me. Didn't take any reason. One night I ran away. And for a long time, I lived a pretty rugged life. But one thing was in my favor. I had a deep voice. When I was 22, Mr. Daly came into a restaurant where I was eating one evening and 
heard me talking. He heard my deep voice. That's when he offered me a job as a ringmaster. But let me get to the point of this, Freckles. What kind of loving God would deal me a hand of cards like your God did? When I was too little to defend myself from my dad, I've heard the Lord's Prayer sometimes, but I can never get past the word Father. I guess I really hate that word. Freckles said, I'm sorry for your pain, but I've got you beat. My parents were dead from a car accident before I was old enough to realize what life even was. I didn't get beaten by either parent because I never knew them. I felt like I didn't belong anywhere. When my folks were killed, the sheriff's office checked high and low for any relatives that I might have and they couldn't find any. I ended up at Boys Town when I was eight. Before that, I didn't even go to school. I just felt lost. Boys Town really helped me. I became a Christian there, along with my two buddies, Pickles and, and Beanie. I don't want to insult you or embarrass you, but I know what your problem with God is. You do. Tell me, you're stuck in time. What do you mean I'm stuck in time? Freckles tenderly put his hand on a, one of Frank's arms and said, Do you love your job like I do mine? Frank smiled and said, Well, I don't have a Shetland pony, but yes, I do love my job. Freckles continued, I think it must be fun to stand before a full circus tent of people and shout, Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Frank laughed and said, Yes, I do love the feeling that it gives me. So you've grown into an adult, a great one, and greatly loved but you're stuck in the memories of your childhood. Why are you still mad at God for growing you up like he did? Let the past go and open your present. You've got a wonderful life and whether you know it or not, God set it all up to bless you, not to curse you. If you study history, lots of people started with soaring lives and ended up being kings, presidents, athletes, movie stars, or something as important as they are. But I don't think you or I would trade where we are today to become one of them. Do you know how many people, famous people, commit suicide? They don't know God. Some others stuck in their past. A person can even get stuck in their recent past. But I see you stuck with the memory of your dad. Frank was quiet for a moment, thinking about what Freckles was telling him. Then he said, You make a lot of sense and you're just a kid. Freckles responded, Every human is in the same condition. They can all tell you about their pain or their lousy life, or they can receive Christ and know that he's with them from the moment they ask him to be their Lord, no matter what happens after that. However rough life is in my future, in spite of all the great things happening now, I know God will get me through it and that I've got a home in heaven waiting for me that will be full of joy forever that is far greater 
than even the joy of being part of Bingham and daily circuits. So what do you want to do about God? He's in this room right now, though neither of us can see him. Would you like to pray and ask Christ, God's only begotten Son, to become the one who is with you and be with you through thick and thin? Of course, the word begotten, <laughs> it might sound like begat to you. Today we would say, instead of begotten, only. Jesus was God's only son. And you know how we all give gifts at Christmas time? Well, God gave the world the best gift that he ever could have given, his only son. To put it bluntly, Jesus Christ came to this earth in order to save the soul of Frank Williams. And believe me, if you think either of us had it rough in our beginning, think what Jesus Christ went through all the time. He was alive on earth. He was born in a smelly manger, not some swanky mansion. And after healing people and loving people, caring about the good, bad, and unlovely, and taking guff from the Pharisees and Sadducees and their followers. He was hung on a cross, and he died in total agony for you and for me. He went to that cross on purpose. Yet three days later, he got out of his grave and he'll always be alive forevermore. Frank said, son, you ought to be a preacher. I've never heard the Bible explained like that. Then Frank looked more serious than Freckles had ever seen him look. And finally he said, sign me up. What do I do to become a Christian? Freckles smiled and said, just ask Christ to be your savior. He'll do the rest. Frank continued to look completely serious and asked, um, are there any special words I need to say? Freckles answered, just talk to him out loud like you would with your best friend and tell him that you want him to lead your life forever. Tell him that you regret your sins because I can tell that you do. So, so can he. Frank felt awkward, but he said, Jesus Christ, you've always been a swear word to me, but no more. I do really want you to save me and be my guide forever. And I am sorry for my sins. Frank was quiet for a moment after he said those words. Then he said, I can't believe I just said that. But something's happening in me right now that's giving me a kind of signal that God heard me. And somehow my life will be in his loving care from now on. Freckles had a huge smile on his face and said, welcome to the family. Just a month after Freckles had been brought to the hospital, he was allowed to go alone with Dapples in a fine long ride in the country. Freckles was all eagerness to get back to the circus. But Mr. Bingham wouldn't hear of it. He said Freckles needed rest after such a shakeup as he'd gone through. So he arranged to board both horse and rider 
at a small hotel on the outskirts of Cedar Bend, where they were, were to remain until the circus went into winter quarters in about a month. So, Freckles and Dapples, it's been a very happy month, taking long excursions into the country. But Freckles wasn't content to be fully idle, so he taught Sir Wilton several new tricks with which to surprise Mr. Bingham. The circus people had been so good to him that he wanted to repay them in that way. Freckles also took time to write long letters to Pickles and Beanie. He tried to convey how beautiful the circus people were and what fun he was having. But he finished the letter by telling them that they were much better off at Boys Town. The circus wreck made thrilling reading for the two friends and they showed Freckles letters to everyone else in Boys Town. Finally, on a chilly day in late November, Sir Wilton and his driver started on the long trip to California where the circus was to go into winter quarters. But they couldn't go together much as Freckles wished they could because Sir Wilton had to travel in a freight car while his driver was on a passenger train. Freckles knew that he would arrive in California several days ahead of his small companion, but he tried to be patient because they'd be together again for the entire winter with leisure for long drives in the land of endless sunshine. Well, that's it for this time. But chapter eight tomorrow is The Circus Fire. <laughs>